and then yeah just moving over to the uk side of things um obviously interested to hear your kind of approaches from the libertines and their manager (laughs) but i was uh enjoying your reaction to their initial demos you felt uh quite offended by them well yeah i'm glad you're asking me this because um first of all pete doherty wrote a book and uh, I, I just happened to be in Rough Trade East in London, and I opened the book and went right to the page where, you know, just accidentally where he's talking about this moment. Like someone asked him, uh, is it true that Gordon Raphael was going to do your own? And they, he said, like, I don't really remember. I think there was some vague talk about it. And even John Hassel, when he was on your show, he didn't remember exactly how that all worked. But the truth of the matter is, that on two separate occasions, very early in their career, I was asked to be the producer. Um, The first time was at the very same club night, club party where I met Toby at Heaven uh, London after the big stroke show. I was sitting next to Banny, the manager and Pete Doherty and I got introduced to them and they both asked me if I would listen to some demos and consider producing their album. And at that time, it was before they were on Rough Trade, and they had a completely different sound. And I don't know how to describe it technically. I was thinking about it today. And it's like some kind of traditional British folk music. It had a very old-timey spirit to it. And this was at a time when Pete and Carl were wearing suits and like playing mostly acoustic instruments. And like I kind of heard those demos, and I thought, you know, it's good, but it's not like it's not the kind of music I understand or I don't know how I would improve it. I don't know what I would do where my gift would come in here. So I just said, like, no, I don't think I want to record this. It's it's not exactly something I, you know, it's not in my expertise and uh, my artistic knowledge. So I don't think I can bring something to the table here. And then a few months later, I had the chance to hear them again. And they had been signed to Rough Trade and suddenly they were an electric band, really fast tempos and really dirty sounds. And I didn't like the demos that I heard. I thought they were highly derivative of the Strokes kind of recorded sound. But the next day after hearing the demo, I went to a rehearsal. This is before they had recorded anything like that was publicly released on Rough Trade and before they'd even toured very much. And when I saw them play those songs, I thought they were phenomenal. Like, I thought this band is one of the greatest rock bands I've heard. I love their harmonies. I loved Gary's drumming. Like, everything about them ticked the boxes of, like, this is my next big band I'm going to record. And I said, yes, I want to record this. I want to be the producer. And I even went on their first tour, which was around the UK with the Libertines. Libertines were playing with the Vines most of the time. But the Strokes, they did a couple of joint shows at some universities uh, with the with the Strokes. And so, yeah, for a while there, I really thought I was going to be the producer of the Libertines. And what happened in the end? Is it more of a, a label decision that they went? went I don't else? know what happened. I just after a meeting with the label, they came back with kind of sad faces you know, because we'd been kind of working together for two months and hanging out every day and we were really getting ready to record. And they kind of said like, um, Rough Trade aren't down with you recording our album. And I don't, I never know why. I don't know whose idea it was. I don't, I don't to this day know what happened, but it's, that's how the story goes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because you got a question from a guy called Brad Jack, who actually said he'd met you in Pontefract a few months ago. Um, Absolutely. Pontefract rocks. <laughs> but he said, he forgot to ask you, uh, if you liked the um, the end product that Mick, Mick Jones produced, like were you into that first album of the Libertines? Well, I have my observation and my point of view is that by the time they actually got in the studio, I think they were a bit too, shall we say, for lack of a better word, messed up to actually play and sing their songs in the way that they had been doing at the very beginning when I saw them. Like it was only, I think it took a while to record that album, maybe a year later it came out after they were signed. Mm. In that time, it just seemed more like the, the graceful and powerful side of the music to me was obscured by the shambolic 
dis disarray. They really capitalized on that. It just sounded like very drunken, out of tuneness, too many layers of guitars that didn't need to be there. Like this is my personal opinion. It's like I never got to hear that group that I met early when they were first signed. I never got to hear a recording of that particular brilliance. Um, and then, yeah, you mentioned doing the sound for the Libertines while they're playing with the Strokes. And it's just right. a funny story of how Pete asked you to introduce him to Julian. And then the next yeah. thing you, you saw, he was leaving 10 minutes later. Yes, <laughs> leaving in a hurry 10 minutes later. <laughs> and I never found out why that was either. But I got told by Julian, never bring him back here again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, there's some theories, I think, in the Meet Me in the Bathroom book. Well, I, I hadn't read those theories yet. No, yeah, I'll leave them there anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, it sounds like you you got to do, it's like a pretty exciting time to be in London, right? Like you got to do some pretty Absolutely. cool stuff. Absolutely. And yeah. lots of New York bands were coming through at the Metro Club and Water Rats and all these. There was lots of great, exciting nights of music in 2002 and 2003 when I lived in London, definitely. And then, yeah, you mentioned hanging around with like the Libertines kind of crowd and that you even you even live with the wolfman um yes peter yeah, wolf I'm, like what I was that like with, as an experience i stayed with the wolfman and his girlfriend for a while um in on like uh amherst street or something like like yeah Am, amwell street uh that's right amwell street in islington and he was a very nice guy he had a lot of strange and disappointed stories of his music career and we shared an affinity for smoking, uh, I think, hash or whatever you call it, gear. Uh, <laughs> we, were, we, were, we were really into that together. By the way, if you don't mind, I'd like to say that we are talking about stories from my book. Yes, yeah. If people don't remember that a lot of the questions you're asking me, I'm trying to really plug my book as much as I can. So I have a book called The World is Going to Love This, Up from the Basement with the Strokes. It just came out this summer, and I'd like everybody to get multiple copies, of course. <laughs> yeah, I can thoroughly recommend this. Okay. I'd say it's essential reading for anyone that's into this podcast, to be honest. It's great. It's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, obviously, I don't want to, like, <laughs> you know, ruin all the stories. But, that's um, fine. You can ask me anything. Okay, great. Um, just a funny one about, you know, it's kind of, with Johnny Burrell, like, it's always been a bit of um I don't know, a bit of a myth about or like an unknown story about how much he was involved with the Libertines, but you kind of said he was, there's a picture of him with the Libertines when you were there. And, right. um, and there's just a funny story about him kind of <laughs> trying to read some poetry at a party or something. Yeah, actually, Toby L. reminded me of that when I was talking, when I was forming the book, I was having chats with Toby about things he remembered. And when me and my best friend, Anna Mercedes, moved from New York to Islington in London, I got a big house because I had some royalties from the Strokes for the first time. And we started having parties to introduce everybody like, hey, we're here. I want to meet musicians. And the Libertines were over a lot and their friends and the filthy McNasty's pub crew would come. And uh, Johnny Burrell was always there and he was always hanging around with the Libertines. And according to Toby, at the first introductory party we threw, suddenly the music was stopped by this young man. And he opens a book and he says, I'm going to read you one of my poems. And he started reading a poem and everybody started booing and they turned the music back on. And that was Johnny Burrell. I was uh, <laughs> doing his routine. Uh, but he, yeah, they hung out all the time and they did shows together and like definitely everybody was friends in those days 